Hello, and welcome everyone to Mulberry Talent Partners Cruise Conversation. I'm just going to give everyone a few moments to log on. Great, looks like everyone is successfully logging on. So again, welcome to Mulberry Talent Partners Career Conversation. My name is Kelsey Tripp, and I am the Talent Acquisition Coordinator here at Mulberry. So a little bit more about Mulberry. We are a full service recruiting and staffing agency located in Portland, Oregon with an office in the Silicon Valley. We specialize in the professional placement of human resources, professional and financial office, payroll and operations positions with direct hire, attempt to hire and contract opportunities. I would encourage you to check out our website at mulberrytalent.com to see our previously recorded webinars, our upcoming webinars, and check out our job opportunities, which we update on a very regular basis. So jumping into introductions, we are joined by Mulberry's very own Lauren Francis and Laura Beck. Lauren is our fabulous founder and president. She started Mulberry back in June of 2017 and comes with over 25 years of talent acquisition experience. We are also joined by Laura Back, our amazing director of marketing and events, and she has been with Mulberry since 2017. And I'm Kelsey Triff. I am the newest Mulberry, and I joined Mulberry, Mulberry back in July of 2020, and I am the talent acquisition coordinator. So we are going to have this webinar be up to 45 minutes today based on feedback from our last webinar. So we're trying that out and we want today to be super interactive. So don't shy away from using the Q&A function in Zoom and we will try to get to any and all questions that come in. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Lauren and Laura. Thank you, Kelsey. We're happy to have everyone here today. Yeah, thank you, Kelsey, for that introduction. Before we go on ahead and jump in, I wanted to do a quick poll of everyone who is on today attending. Uh, this is an anonymous poll. We'd like just to know what stage of the career you're at. So if everyone can just respond to that. Um, what's kind of fun is that the Mulberry team is sort of representative of, of all different kinds of career stages. And so let's see what we have here today. Great. It looks like we have a good mix of recent college graduates, mid-career, senior career professionals, and some who are pivoting their careers. So exciting. We're so glad to have you here today. I'm going ahead and end that poll now. And there are the results. So jumping into cover letters, I think uh, one question that comes up a lot, Lauren, and I wanted to ask you this as a recruiter, are hiring managers and recruiters still reading cover letters? They are, and it's particularly when they ask for a cover letter to be submitted with the resume, it's important to pay attention to what the uh, submission requirements are. And I find that a lot of people uh, tend to feel or just sort of assume that that may not be important, but it, but it, really, it really is. Uh, it's true, it is true that there are many, you know, for example, with LinkedIn, you can do, or many, many different, um, Posting sites, you can do, you can click, quick, click, or quick, quick reply, I guess, or quick submission. And so there's a lot of that happening, but I do feel that uh, the cover letter makes a big difference in whether or not you will be selected for the interview process. Sure. I think it's always better to include a cover letter than to not include a cover letter because you just don't know who's going to be reading it on the other end. All right, so jumping in. So today we're gonna to cover cover letters, how to check in during the interview process, and then the ever important thank you notes. Okay, so before we jump into what to do with the cover letter, here are some common missteps that we've all made at some point in time. The first is using a generic template. And what I mean by that is basically using the first template that you've found on Google, plugging in some of your information, but really failing to personalize it. Um, what this does for the hiring manager, it shows that you're, you're sort of just moving about your job application process um, and not really giving too much thought to the individual application at their organization. The second one, and this is the big one, is writing the wrong information. So that could be having the wrong organization, having the wrong hiring manager, the wrong position, 
I think this is really easily done when we are applying to a lot of different positions. We're sort of plugging and playing into our cover letters and we could miss it. So my recommendation would be, if you have a sort of template that you're working off of, have blank spaces for those details that you're going to need to change out each time. So the hiring manager name, the organization name, the job title name, so that you are setting yourself up for success in terms of not having the wrong information in there because that just puts the wrong foot forward. The third thing that you don't want to do is overstate the facts or basically repeat your resume. So this is an opportunity in the cover letter to expand on your resume to show the hiring manager a different side of who you are. They don't need to just read a repeat of your resume. If they are reading your cover letter, it means that they've read your resume and so they want to learn more about you. So use that opportunity. And then the last thing that you don't want to do is bring up your salary or your references. So salary will come up at a different point in time. Um, you don't want to necessarily put that into a cover letter and have that be the focus. And then references at this, basically in any interview process, you can assume that they're going to ask for your references. So you don't need to mention it in the cover letter. Okay, so jumping right in, three steps to an effective cover letter. So the first is that you wanna captivate the reader in your opening paragraph. And we'll talk about in future slides what that looks like. The second is that you wanna align your experience, skills, past projects or accomplishments with the particular role that you're applying for. And then the last is really important. You wanna demonstrate your passion for joining their organization. So I know that cover letters can be really tedious and if you're, if you're applying for a lot of jobs, it can kind of bog you down. But I would say, look at doing the cover letter as a way of preparing for an interview. So you're researching the company, you're thinking about how you would fit into that specific role. Um, you're taking some notes and jotting them down. It's all part of the, the preparation. And if you have a sort of template that you're working off of where you have key skills that you already want to highlight, um, this is just a way to supplement it. So try to not let it get you down. Look at it as a positive for just another step of interview preparation. Yeah, and Laura, uh, the other point too is that so many times, especially when people are pivoting in their career or they're looking to pivot, mm -hmm. to, to have an opportunity to demonstrate what their skills and how the, the skills that they have are transferable into this other role. And we found that that, that works very well for so many different uh, levels of you know, where people are in their careers. For example, uh, we had a candidate once who had a lot of experience in customer service, but they didn't put it on their resume. Mm -hmm. And because I, after talking with him about, you know, what, you know, tell me what you did prior to this first job out of college. And he had this amazing background. Not only that, he had incredible um, uh, work history. And so we added that back to his resume. And anyway, it made it, it made a big difference in how, because he was trying to get into, uh, uh, there was a pivot opportunity pivot situation for him as well. It made a big difference and he ended up um, getting getting the job he wanted. That's great, that's great. Yeah, the, the cover letter is really a place where you can fill in some gaps mm -hmm. for that hiring manager or recruiter. Something about your resume got them interested in your background. So that's great. Now give them the why of why you're gonna fit into that role. And we'll talk a little bit, I'll share an example um, where someone talked about a career pivot in their, in their cover letter. You know, and one more thing before we go on is we talk a lot, we use the word pivot now regularly. Mm -hmm. and what, you know, what, what is a pivot? I mean, I, we, we do find that there are, there are many people that have, are senior, senior in their, not senior in their career, but they're, they're advanced in their career and they're looking to transition into another stage, bring their skills and experience and add value in another way. Uh, we'll see, I met, talked to with a candidate earlier this week that had thought she wanted to go into finance, to, you know, went through college, went through the whole, and graduated with a degree in accounting, started her first accounting job, and then was not so sure that was the right, the right uh, uh, direction for her. And, uh, and so she's looking to make some changes. And so, and, 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 and again, in this situation, her background is uh, in just very strong work history and has a lot to bring to a new organization. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, we're seeing a lot of career pivots, especially uh, because of the pandemic. People are looking for more stability in their industry, or maybe they've sort of reached the, the peak of their career, um, but they're maybe looking for something with less responsibility or, or more areas to grow in different ways. So we're seeing a lot of that. Um, 
it's kind of an exciting time for job seekers, I think. And I, it looks like from the poll, we have a lot of people who are considering a career pivot. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so just some basic formatting guidelines. So you want to treat your resume and cover letter as a set. So that should be matching font, font size, and header. And I'll show you an example, um, actually, of Kelsey's cover letter and resume um, that really complement each other well. And then you want to follow basically a standard business letter format. So what I mean by this is you don't want to have it um, as informal as an email. Um, so you want to have, you know, the, the date and, and the company and the, and the contact. Uh, stick to one page with standard margins. And then this is really important for both your resume and your cover letter. And I've, I'll say this a lot. Uh, save the document with your name, your full name, um, and then spell out what it is. So Laura Back cover letter. On your end, if it's more, um, if, if it helps you to stay organized, you could say Laura Back cover letter Mulberry Talent Partners, so the company that you're applying for. Now, if you do this, going back to the missteps, you want to make sure that you don't send the wrong, you want to change the name. So if I'm applying to Mulberry Talent Partners, I don't want it to say Laura Back cover letter Intel, right? Because that immediately signals to the, I mean, hiring managers know that you're applying to different places. We know that. Um, that's the smart thing to do as a candidate, but you want in this moment for them to feel like you're focused on them and you don't want them to know where else you're applying. Okay, so here's an example. I'm highlighting Kelsey. Uh, Kelsey joined us last July and I was really impressed by her cover letter and her resume. Here is her resume. As you can see, it's really nicely laid out. And then, dang, there's her cover letter. So the format is familiar. It shows me that she has an attention to detail, which for this particular role was really important and has proven to be true with Kelsey. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was just really aesthetically pleasing. So, so think about that when you're sending the, the cover letter that it should mirror your resume. Okay, so here's just kind of the basic format for a cover letter. So you have your greeting, and we'll talk about each of these in more detail. Um, and then paragraph one is your intro and your hook. Uh, then two, moving into your experience and how it fits with the role. And then finally, you wanna demonstrate your passion or interest in their organization. And then you're gonna conclude it as you would. So greeting, you wanna avoid using to whom it may concern. It's outdated, it's a little formal. Um, and then if you are able to find the hiring manager's name, don't assume gender. So use their full name instead. And then if you can't locate the hiring manager's name, I would say do your, do your due diligence, try to do it. But if you absolutely can't, it's okay to use your hiring manager or as Kelsey did in hers was um, she addressed it to the Mulberry Talent Partners team, which was great because we all were reading her resume and cover letter. And so it was nice that it was addressed to all of us. Okay, and then moving into the introduction. Like I, I've said, this is probably the most important piece of your cover letter. This is what's going to draw the reader in to want to continue to, to read on. So your intro sets the tone of the cover letter and should align with the organization that you're applying to. So if you're applying to a creative agency, your cover letter is going to look very different than if you're applying to a law firm or a finance firm. Um, so you want to start with a hook or an opening statement, and I have some below that I'll read. Um, and be sure to include the position that you're applying to. A hiring manager or recruiter might be filling multiple roles. Um, and so you want your cover letter to be really obvious about what you're applying for. And I think sometimes it's easy to, to miss including that. So here's an example. I recently spoke with Jane Smith, uh, who shared that a role within the HR department would be becoming available soon. They recommended that I connect with you directly to share how my experience and qualifications might be a great fit for the HR BP role. So if you know someone at the organization who has recommended you, this is a great opportunity to name drop. If you have it, use it. And then here's another one. Uh, after learning about your organization from a talk that Jane Smith gave last October at the Women in Tech Conference, I had hoped an opportunity to join your team would arise. I'm excited to put my application forward for the web developer role on your team. So what this intro does is a couple of different things. So it tells us that you are genuinely interested in the organization and that have had some interaction with it before. It also shows us that you're um, involved in your professional community, which is fantastic. Um, and then it expresses your interest in that particular role. If you have not had, you know, if you don't have a connection at the company, that's okay. If you have not attended a talk by somebody at the company, that's okay. But if the organization really resonates with you, you could maybe find an article or highlight something that they had done recently that explains why you're so excited that that opportunity has come up. 
So don't fret if you don't have either of these. Great point. And then here, uh, we love career contessa here at Mulberry Talent Partners. So here's just an example of one that they had done. I would encourage you to go online and read examples of different introductions and find what sort of fits with your, with your voice. So here's one where they're focusing on keywords, which is really important um, if your resume and cover letter are going into an applicant tracking system. So Microsoft Excel and ADP Virtual Edge are two of my strongest areas of expertise. Through my years in management and HR, I have perfected my skills and increased my knowledge in social recruiting, employee development, collaborative interviewing, and handling employee relations issues. It is the combination of these skills and my passion for the field of HR that makes me the best candidate for your campus recruiter position. So really great. And you could sort of take something like this and plug and play and make it your own. Right, and it's also confident, but not uh, pushy. It it just right. shows. Uh, it's just a very strong uh, opening and and uh, uh, you know introduction, really. Right, it would get me excited as a hiring manager, yeah. sure. especially if I was looking for Excel and ADB Virtual Edge. If you see these keywords in there and they are they're talking about something that you are really skilled at, sell it absolutely sell it so true and that's you know paying attention to those things i think too it will make the difference between particularly if you're trying to let's say your skill set is reaching towards some of these areas but may not be um you know fully the full, full experience may not be there what it does the cover letter will do is it will the it will it will allow the hiring manager to see you and focus on on, on what, you, what you're bringing to the role. And mm -hmm. chances are you will end up in the, we will want to interview this person um, aisle, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah. Absolutely. We had a question come in. Okay. So Jill is wondering, do you recommend using a copywriter for cover letters and resumes? I would say if you have the means to do so and maybe writing isn't your strongest skill set, absolutely. Um, if you find that you're really struggling with writing a cover letter, um, I don't think it's a bad idea to ever get a little bit of extra help. Um, and that could even be if you don't have the means to, to get that sort of professional help. Um, write out your cover letter and have a, a friend or professional colleague review it for you and give their, give their input and advice. I think the more eyes that you can get on something, the better, the better you'll do. Would you agree, Lauren? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there are so many examples out there online, um, not, not to copy, but I think we can all gain inspiration and you don't always have to recreate the wheel. It's true, you know, and, and that goes for writing thank you notes, which we'll go into later, but we sometimes we feel like we're saying the same thing over and over and over again. So you do need to find inspiration from others and from other examples, you know, you've heard, you know, you don't need to reinvent the wheel, but you want to find your voice, like Laura had said earlier, but you also want to find some inspiration. So there are so many resources available that um, we, we, we feel that there are, there are a lot out there that you can, you can utilize and have some Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We have an, actually another question that came in. Okay. Um, so Denise is wondering, what would you advise for a person who has been made redundant at 50 and wants to be, and wants to change from? Mm -hmm. Oh, change from administrative role to new homes sales consultant. Okay, it, well, a lot of what we're talking about really does match what, sh what the question was, meaning that you've got a, 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 a tremendous skill set and the ability to take those skills and, and, and well, you know, to take, look at the job description and see how the job description matches your skills and abilities. And uh, that's a perfect example of, of, of utilizing some of the things we're talking about today. Right, right. So my advice would be to look at um, the job descriptions that you're most interested in, um, write out the skills that they're looking for, and then look at your experience, write it out and kind of create a little bit of a map. Um, so you're mapping it out in your own mind, both for the cover letter. And then when you get to the interview, again, this is all preparation. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, especially with the administrative foundation, that is the key to a lot of roles. And so I think that you'll be able to, to pull it off well. Mm -hmm. It just takes a little bit of effort. Mm -hmm. Certainly. And use your friends and your network and your, your coworkers and so on. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And I would encourage you if you were not on our last webinar to go back to our YouTube channel and take a look. Last week we talked about, or two weeks ago, we talked about um, how to really improve your LinkedIn, um, especially as you're pivoting your career um, and how to kind of do an intro to some online cold networking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Moving into the body paragraphs. So I'd say two to three max. Again, um, you don't necessarily have to limit yourself to two if, it, if, it, if it's not fitting well. So what you wanna do is describe your accomplishments as they relate to the role at hand while weaving in your soft skills. You want to find your why for why you want to join their organization. So what appeals to you about this organization and how can you weave that in so that they know that you've done your research and you're genuinely excited about joining them. Again, you wanna focus on keywords from the job description. And then if this role represents a career shift, use this space to focus on your transferable skills and kind of draw it out for the recruiter or hiring manager as to why you're a good fit, even if you're not coming from their traditional background. And we can look a little bit at some examples. So here is a career pivot example. And again, we're using Kelsey um, just because she did such a great job. So I'll read it out. My interest in the talent acquisition coordinator role stems largely from my passion to connect and communicate with others. In my current role, I manage 60 to 70 different high profile clients and interact with senior executives on a daily basis. I successfully manage the many different personalities, goals, and ideas of my clients. I thrive on connecting with my clients to deeply understand their visions and goals, then creating a plan to help them be successful. These skills that I have learned in the event industry have set me up for success as I pivot my career into a new industry. So she's covered a lot here. What she did was she looked at what she would need in talent acquisition and took what she's done in the event industry and put them together. And if you know anything about talent acquisition, you know that these are all skills and experience that would lead to, to success on the job. Yeah, so from this cover letter and from meeting with Kelsey, we knew that, that we, were, we were going to have a successful match. And yeah, she's here. <laughs> she's and we did, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're so happy. Okay. Highlighting experience. Here's another one. Should I be awarded the opportunity to serve as your executive assistant? I believe that my experience at my current organization and prior organization have provided me with a strong foundation for being able to provide high level administrative support. In both positions, I have supported project managers, directors, and agency owners with day-to-day -day administrative tasks, as well as taking the lead on independent longer term projects. More so, I am familiar with policies and procedures that come along with working for a healthcare organization and employees to adapt well at your organization. I have found that I truly enjoy and thrive when I am provided with the opportunity to support those around me. Now, isn't that yours, Laura? It is. This is mine from about seven, seven or so years ago when I was applying to return to um, my work at UCSF in San Francisco. Yeah, so what I tried to do here was um, weave in a little bit of my soft skills in terms of being able to take on independent projects while also enjoying the administrative tasks of, of supporting others and then being able to fit into their organization. And so again, this could be, if you're coming from a different industry, going to another one, maybe finding some, some common themes just to explain why, why you would be able to make that transition well. You know, and then to be able to articulate it so well and clearly, and what Laura was saying earlier, it, it sets you up for the interview because you're capturing all of what you bring and what they're looking for, and you're bringing your, your experience forward. And it's just very, very well written. Well done. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I did get that job, and then I moved <laughs> up and found you. So. <laughs> right. And that's the thing. You can look back at former cover letters that you've done. You can beg and borrow from your own previous work. So you don't always have to recreate the wheel. So you can draw on inspiration from your prior self as well. And then here's another one. So what I'll do is I'll share these slides with everyone so that um, you could take a look a little bit deeper. So we're not spending too much time on reading examples that might not apply directly to, to you. And then just a simple conclusion, I would greatly appreciate the opportunity to discuss my professional experiences further, as well as the position. Um, I look forward to connecting with you soon. So just a nice, simple closing that invites further conversation, I think is, is appropriate in this case. And again, in your own voice. So um, while we move on, what I would like to know is from 
from today and back, um, do you submit a custom cover letter for each role that you apply to? And if you answer no in the comments, if you will, moving forward. We see sometimes coming in. No, oh, there's one no. So again, I think it really depends on, you know, if, if you're applying for a job that asks for a cover letter, 100% you should put a cover letter in. Um, because if you don't, sometimes you'll just be automatically weeded out for not following that direction. So it looks like we have, I'll go ahead and share this so everyone can see. The majority of yes, a few no's, and then a few sometimes. So again, it can vary um, if you have any you know, comments to share, we'd love to hear from you in the chat and Kelsey can fill us in if, if anyone does. Okay, so moving on to checking in during the interview process. So Lauren, tell me a little bit about how often a candidate should be checking in with either the recruiter or hiring manager in an interview process. Well, hopefully if you've had the first interview or screening, you would ask about timing. And, and understand what their process looks like and so on. Uh, and, and as we all know, the timing that is declared is not always the timing that um, is, is laid out. So anyway, we do find that if, the, if a hiring manager mentions that, the, that we should know next steps by next Wednesday, uh, it, and Wednesday comes and goes, uh, the best thing to do is to wait a few days to inquire further. And many times you will not hear a word or a response or a reply from your inquiry. And so again, wait a week or sometimes somewhere between three and five days would be sufficient. And again, when, when you do respond, it's important not to show irritation or you know concerns about not hearing. It, it's, it, and we can gracefully. Mm -hmm. uh, with a recruiter, I think your, your recruiter, if it's a recruiter from an outside recruiter or even an internal recruiter within an organization, they generally can, well, staffing agency recruiters are your advocate. So I, I myself would like to hear from you regularly. And there are times we really make an every effort to try to return your uh, inquiries promptly and efficiently. Sometimes we don't. So we welcome you to re, you know, reach back out to us. Very, very important. And we do want you to you know, stay, stay with us. Uh, we, sometimes we just, we don't get the information that we need and we just have to say, we just haven't heard, we're waiting to hear and all of that. You've, we've all been there before. So again, being gracious, thoughtful about timing and generally you should receive the information that you're looking for. So, yeah, and I would say just further on that to always check in with your recruiter contact after each interview that you have, um, it just keeps that line of conversation going and you stay at top of mind for them. Recruiters appreciate um, that, that check-in to know that you're still interested. So if a hiring manager comes to them, they can say, oh yes, I heard from them right after the interview. They're very excited about the opportunity and they've, they've checked in appropriately from time to time as well. Mm -hmm. So here's an example of how you could check in. Dear Laura, I hope this email finds you well. I thoroughly enjoyed meeting with you on Tuesday and learning more about the payroll specialist position with Mulberry Talent Partners. I'm following up to see if there's an update on the status of the position. I believe that my background is a match for what you're looking for and I'm excited about the opportunity to join the Mulberry team. I look forward to hearing next steps. So in here, there is kind of a call to action but it's not abrasive. Um, it's not saying I need to know, it's just, it's just a nice, informal check-in um, that I think would be appreciated. And again, we'll share these so that everyone can have some examples. Here's a little bit of one that's a little bit longer. And then we'll move right into thank you notes, which are so, so important. Um, so Kelsey, I think Kelsey has a couple questions. Yeah, we have two questions that came in related to the last topic. So Joan is wondering, what's the reasonable number of times to check in with a recruiter? It's a great question, Lauren. Well, for me, it, it, I, I would speak for me, but I, I think that if you are working with a staffing agency, uh, you that they are your advocate 
they're, you're working together. And so I would say that regularly is important. Uh, sometimes if, if, a, if a recruiter says, you know, we just have not heard from the, the hiring manager, we're checking in regularly, we're trying to get information, I will reach out to you when I know more. In that case, we all are just have to wait. Uh, but we are actively engaged in trying to find out next steps and in information. Um, with an internal recruiter or a hiring manager, again, we, we feel just the same sort of setup that we, we expressed before, which is to wait a few days after and then to follow up in a, in a and, and sometimes, honestly, it, the, this happens and all of us know this, that sometimes we just never hear from companies again. We've engaged, we've connected. And, and, and one of the things I will say that try not to take it personally, uh, I know it's hard sometimes. Sometimes we feel, I don't like the word rejection at all. I really try to not use that in my vocabulary uh, because I find it to be so negative. But sometimes it's just, sometimes companies will cancel a requisition or change things or put things on hold and they, they don't reach out to the candidates that have been involved and, and that's unfortunate but it happens and we have to just move on right and we kind of touched on this but what about melanie's wondering what about checking in during the application process during the application process so i think that would be they've submitted their application and they'd like to to check in on the status oh. yeah i think that that is very appropriate and to basically it's the same it's the same process Right. Well, and I think too, um, if you've just applied through um, an applicant tracking system, but maybe you saw on LinkedIn mm -hmm. that a particular recruiter was the one who was responsible responsible for posting it, I think it might be appropriate to to reach out and make that connection and let them know that you've applied and you're hopeful um, to have a, a conversation with them at some point. Mm -hmm. As long as it's done professionally, I think every little bit of contact is okay and, and could only help you. I think too, when you're, when you are reaching out, you, you won't, you, it's, it's important not to ask for a call to action or something for the, for the recruiter or the, uh, that the individual to respond to, meaning when can I expect to hear from you? You don't want to say those kinds of things, right? You don't say I, I'm expressing interest. I applied to the position and I hopefully will, will, will have an opportunity to interview and leave it there. Exactly. Yeah. You never want to be pushy. You never know, you know, the, the load, the workload that they have on their end, um, you don't want to burden them at all, even if it's not your intention to. Right, of course. So moving into thank you notes, thank you notes are incredibly important. Um, and so the first thing is timing is key. So we recommend always that you send it the same day, if possible. If you can't, you need to send it within 24 hours of your interview. Otherwise, you sort of are trailing down um, and they're wondering if they're going to send it or if you're kind of, if they're an afterthought. Um, if you had multiple interview interviewers, you want to send each an individual email. If you don't have their emails, you could use a service like hunter.io where you can go on and learn the naming convention for their emails if you know the person's first and last name. Um, or you could simply ask the recruiter either for their emails or to go on ahead and for the thank you notes and always personalize the note and I'm going to share some examples um, and I'll read through one and then I, I, I'll gloss over the next two that we have but again we'll share these with you. Now sometimes it is appropriate to send it to the team to send one note to the team it just depends on how the interview uh, process uh, unfolded so there there are there are opportunities to do that as well. It's, it's Sort of depends, but you could always get advice if you're working with a staffing agency, you could get advice from the staffing agency on, on how best to proceed. Mm -hmm. So here's an example. Um, like I said, I'll just read through one. Um, it was an absolute pleasure speaking with you today about the role. Thank you for taking the time to walk me through some of the challenges and successes that the company has had over the last year. It was particularly wonderful to hear that this role is being added because the company is doing so well and the HR team is expanding. After speaking with you, I believe even more strongly that my experience in benefits management and employee support will help streamline, streamline your internal processes and allow you to focus on managing the HRBP team. 
In addition, the opportunity to develop my compensation skills excites me greatly and I'm confident that I will excel in this area as well. I would love to discuss this opportunity further, so please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any additional questions. So what this thank you note does is thank them, obviously, first and foremost for their time. Um, it shares why they're excited about the position, even more so um, than they were before the interview. And then they weave in a little bit of their experience just to drive home again that they're a really good fit. And this opportunity to develop compensation skills, instead of saying, while I don't have compensation experience or um, while this is what I'm missing, they're focusing on the positive of being able to develop it and that they're confident that they would be able to excel. So maybe compensation was brought up in the interview as something that they didn't have. So they're kind of turning it into something positive and expressing some confidence. This is also a, a, a time where you could add something to the interview, meaning you thought a little bit more about the question on X and wanted to expand on that point or whatever. And so those are those are just great ways to, and then you're drawing from the interview and mm -hmm. you're bringing more information forward. Right, you're continuing that conversation. So I would say that an email like this will win out over an email that just simply says, thank you for meeting with me today. I look forward to hearing from you. Right. right. While that email is better than sending nothing, this is one that continues to get the interviewer excited about you mm -hmm. um, and to continue that conversation. So when in doubt, add a little bit more and personalize it. So again, I have some more examples um, that I will share in the email. Um, and then I think we're gonna move into the Q&A portion um, if Kelsey wants to take over. Yeah, so it looks like we have a few more minutes left. So if anybody has any questions for us, it doesn't have to be related to the webinar today either. Could just be some general questions regarding interviewing or resumes or anything. Feel free to ask the question in our Q&A function in Zoom. Okay, while we wait for some questions to come in, Kelsey, I wanted to ask when you were in your job search, what resources did you find helpful in terms of um, inspiration for cover letters since yours were so great? Yeah, um, so I got my template off of Etsy. Yeah. I think I purchased it for like $8. Um, oh, wow. But that was something that I use regularly and I loved that it corresponded with my cover letter template as well. Mm -hmm. So I used that from Etsy. Um, I was a big career Contessa fan as well. And um, always looking on LinkedIn to see what kind of connections I had and, you know, just constantly job searching on LinkedIn as well and Indeed and I even looked at Career Contessa and I was also reading books and um, attending webinars like these and podcasts. So I had a lot of different um, things that I was using for my job search. Um, it looks like we had two questions come in from Patricia. So she said, how do you address hiring gaps and employment gaps? Okay, right. So that I think you, you necessarily, Generally, you wouldn't address hiring gaps in a cover letter unless it was something where you took maybe some considerable time off for a certain reason. And like, I'm, I'm coming back into the workforce after X, Y, or Z. Uh, so it, 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 yeah, that, that certainly could be a place. I think sometimes people try to explain things as opposed to just state them. And there's a big difference between that. It, it, between those two, those two positionings. Uh, yeah, I would say that we just did a, if you want to check out our Instagram, we just did a post this week about um, addressing unemployment in the interview. So again, you wouldn't necessarily bring it up in your cover letter, but I think it's really important to be prepared for that question in an interview, rehearse it. Um, the top, the kind of key takeaways from that were to keep it positive, never talk negatively about a former employer, um, just state the facts. You don't have to explain a lot. You could just say that your job was made redundant, um, right? I mean, I, I, there are a whole host of reasons. You want to just try to keep it positive. And if you've rehearsed the answer, you're going to be able to answer it with confidence. Absolutely. And you do want to have that, be able to position your background in a way that is professional and not too wordy or lengthy, or like I said, explaining things. I talked to a CEO earlier today uh, earlier this week, a friend of ours from the Bay Area, and she was saying she's never been asked about her, her gaps in employment. She raised three boys and so on. And 
and, and the other thing too, is that very companies aren't asking about gaps as much hiring, hiring uh, professional, they're not asking about gaps as much as, as they were in the past. It's a, it's not as, it's, it, people aren't focused on that as much. Yeah. We're finding. Okay. We have also another question um, and this is from Joan. So she says, if I'm applying for a particular role that only meets say 60% of the skills in the job description, how do I convince the hiring manager that I can do the job? And basically rather than saying, I don't have the experience. Right. Again, it's focusing on what you do bring, mm -hmm. the transferable skills that you have. That again, you want to go with the positive and what what you have, and that you're excited to learn and grow in that area. As right. well, I think too that if you look back at what you've done, mm. probably been some point in your career where you've taken on a new project uh, that you had no experience with. So if you could highlight. Mm. Um, a, a project or an event that you planned with with no prior experience and the success. So if you can uh, highlight a specific experience using um, numbers or different facts, mm -hmm. I think that, that would be a way to demonstrate that you are capable of, of learning and growing and taking on new things. Definitely. Okay, and we have another question. So our handwritten thank you notes now considered obsolete. I ask only because I've noticed that the team who I interviewed, who interviewed me at my current role still have the thank you notes I sent to each of them pinned on their respective walls. Oh, that is so lovely. Well, you know, I think it depends. I, some people do both. I, with the pandemic, so many people aren't at their offices. So it does make it a little bit, it's a little harder to, for, to know if someone's going to receive a, a, a thank you note that's been mailed. <laughs> So I, so that's one point. And then I've got to run, I've got the doorbell. I'll be right back. <laughs> Laura, carry on. I could share one example of this um, at a prior position. We had a really fantastic interview with this candidate. I mean, we left feeling like she was the perfect fit for our small organization. And then we didn't hear anything. And so we were left wondering, oh my gosh, have, you know, have we been ghosted? Um, but then a couple of days later, her thank you note arrived and it was very lovely. And she ended up getting the job. And so it did turn around, but it kind of left us with this loss of momentum. So again, like Lauren said, I think when we get out of the pandemic, I think a handwritten thank you note is lovely, especially as kind of a nice way to check in, but still send that email because you don't want to have the team feel like, what happened? Popped balloon. I mean, what happened? We didn't hear back from that candidate. So my husband just came in from a business trip. So <laughs> he didn't have a key to the front door. <laughs> so I'm back. Okay, well, we have another question. Do you think the role of the remote slash virtual EA is here to stay even when, when the pandemic is over? Also, how can you best address the influence the pandemic might have on your job search, i.e. being furloughed, et cetera? Okay, so the first part, do you think the role of remote virtual EA? I think, I wouldn't you say it depends, Lauren? I think it depends on the organization and the, and the comfort level of the executive that you're right. supporting. We're, we're going to see more hybrid uh, uh, roles, meaning you know, two days in the office, three days you know, working remotely. So I, 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 I don't know, it's just going to be a, so many different things. We feel, we see a lot of remote roles staying remote. Uh, and then there's also a lot of talk about companies wanting to bring people back together again. And, but again, I don't think it's going to look like what it looked like. So the hybrid uh, piece comes into play. And then how can you best address the influence the pandemic might have on your job search, i.e. being furloughed? I think that kind of goes back to what we talked about. I mean, just yeah. having a specific answer to your, your job situation. And I think it's, an uncommon situation in this pandemic. Um, so I, like Lauren said, it might not even be a question that comes up in an interview just because it's so common. Yeah, and they look at the dates. I mean, we would, during the um, economic downturn of 2008, you know, people, many people took on uh, many, many contract roles and contract roles were, were, were uh, kind of common, but, but you know, we, we, people understood that there was a there was a economic crisis and people were doing what they could to stay employed and kind of stay in their careers. 
Okay, well, it looks like we have hit that 1245 mark. Um, so we have some exciting new upcoming conversations in the works. So make sure to join us next Tuesday, February 16th for a leadership conversation with Tracy Hooper, who just wrote an amazing book called The New Hello. Then we have Katie Kelly on February 18th, next Thursday to speak about her book called Career Courage. And then we have Lisa Orbe Austin on March 4th to speak about overcoming imposter syndrome and owning your greatness. And here are a few ways to stay in touch. So feel free to check out our website, connect with us on LinkedIn or email us. We would love to hear from you. And I wanna thank you all for choosing to fly with Mulberry. We know that you have many different options when it comes to webinars and we're so happy that you chose ours. And I wanna say a big thank you to Lauren and Laura for an amazing conversation. Thank you so much, Laura. This was well, well, well pulled together. And I, I think so many people benefited from the information today. So I look forward to hearing from everyone. I hope so. And when you sign off of Zoom today, there's going to be a very short survey. We would love to hear your thoughts um, and appreciate any feedback you have to share. Thank you all. Hearing us. Bye, everyone. See you next time. <laughs>